Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to our Warsaw University Astronomical Observatory Tuesday seminar series. And today we have Professor Andrzej Pigulski from uh, Institute of Astronomy of University of Wrocław, who's going to tell us about the forthcoming but uh, groundbreaking Legacy Survey in Space and Time LSST uh, survey. Andrzej, please. Thank you. Thank you, Łukasz. I very much regret I can't be in Warsaw in person, but I have a, a lecture today, so it was not possible to come to Warsaw um, to give this seminar. So this will be online. Maybe I'm not the best person to talk about legacy surveys, space and time, because I'm quite new to this project. However, uh, Ukash asked me to give this talk because I gave a similar talk in our seminar. So this is, so this is it. Uh, this is a, this is quite an unusual project. So it's a really worth, I mean, to present this project to, to the wide astronomical community, especially in Poland. Uh, the history of the project started a long time ago. Uh, <clears throat> in the early 90s of the 20th century, uh, there was a publication which is uh, titled Astronomy and Astrophysics in the New Millennium. It's a summary of some projects that were planned for the next century, the 21st century. And among these, the major initiatives you can see here in this table was this large aperture synoptic survey telescope, LSST, how this uh, project was called. You can see also among the, all the, the, this project, the next generation space telescope, which is now known as, as uh, James Webb Space Telescope, and it's on the, it's, it's observing now. But there are some, also some other projects that were abandoned, for example, the Terrestrial Planet Finder. Uh, going back to the LSST, because this is, so, so at the beginning, the LSST was the name of the telescope. Uh, so this is the abbreviation coming from the large, sometimes aperture was added, large aperture synoptic survey telescope. So it was planned to be a 6.5 meter class optical telescope, designed to survey the visible sky every week down to a much fainter level that that reached by existing surveys. So there are two main ideas behind this project. The first was to, uh, to, to go deep, so to observe very faint objects. And the other idea was, of course, to, to provide the time series photometry, multiband time series photometry. And in, in principle, these main ideas uh, were left. So the, the final project is, is, uh, follows this, this first ideas. Uh, sometimes the project was also, the telescope was called also dark matter telescope because the Revealing the nature of dark matter was uh, one of the driving uh, uh, science of this telescope, of this idea. Uh, slightly more about the history of the project. In 2003, the uh, so-called LSST Corporation was founded. It was uh, a non-profit, it is still, a non-profit organization that supports the project. And activities were supported uh, by the government money, I mean, mainly, of course, National Science Foundation, but also money from private foundations, individual donors and membership fees, also grants to universities, and uh, also in-kind support from the US Department of Energy Laboratories and other member institutions. Uh, the two main contributions from uh, private uh, from private money was in 2007, two donations. Uh, first from uh, Charles Simoni, or in fact, I would say Simoni Karole, because Charles Simoni is, is or originally from Hungary, uh, from International Software, uh, who donated 20 million US dollars to this project, and Bill Gates uh, from Microsoft, 10,000 million dollars. Uh, in 2010, the project was identified as a priority in the 2010 Decadal Survey, 
So after this funding from NSF and the Department of Energy came, so the project was started very, very fast. So the uh, corner, stores, uh, corner stone has been built in 2015. And uh, at the same year, the a construction of the 3.2 gigapixel camera, very big camera for this project, which is very important for these observations started to be constructed. In 2019, US Congress named it Observatory, the Observatory, the Vera Rubin Observatory. Uh, so this is, uh, the, there's, uh, so maybe it's, it's worth explaining the names which are behind this project because this changed it in time. So the original name uh, of the telescope was Large Aperture Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST. But now this LSST abbreviations is the abbreviation of the project. So this is called Legacy Survey of Space and Time. The observatory itself is called Vera Rubin Observatory, but this is observatory which hosts just this one telescope, which is in turn named after the larger donator, private donator, Simoni Survey Telescope. So these are the names related to this project. And here you can see this uh, very unusual telescope. The telescope uh, will be located or practically is located in the so-called uh, Cerro Pachon Observatory, which is uh, very close to the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Uh, at this side, we have already two other telescope, which is Gemini South, eight meter telescope, and Southern Astrophysical Research Telescope uh, or SOAR Telescope, four meter telescope. So Shimoni Survey Telescope will be the third uh, large telescope in this site. Uh, as I said, it is located, the observatory is located very close to the CTIO. So we uh, astronomers have good measurements of seeing in this site and already know that this is a very good site for observing because the average number of clear nights per year is, is more than 250. The cost of the project is, is presently more than 400 million US dollars. So it's larger than predicted in the 90s, but of course dollars are not the same as, as, as the 90s. Cerro Pachon and, of course, CTIO are located north of Santiago, close to La Serena y Conquibo, Conquimbo. A few uh, words about Vera Rubin, who, uh, after, uh, because after Vera Rubin, the observatory is called, or Vera Florence Cooper Rubin. She was born in 1928. Uh, uh, her parents uh, were... Uh, Jewish immigrant, uh, her father, uh, whose name was uh, Pesach Kopczewski, was born in Vilnius, uh, Polish at that time. So he emigrated to the US, uh, anglicized his name to Philip Cooper. And uh, her mother came from uh, now Moldova, uh, Rose Applebaum, uh, he came from Bessarabia, now it's, it's, it's Moldova. So she was interested in astronomy very much and started observing uh, stars uh, very early. Uh, in 1954, she defended his PhD in Georgetown University, Washington, and started to work. It's, at the beginning, he teached math and physics in Montgomery College, but then, uh, uh, then uh, he, he, uh, started scientific work in his uh, home university, Georgetown University. But in, 60, in 1965, he moved to uh, Carnegie Institute of Washington and especially McDonald Observatory, where she observed very frequently. So almost all her scientific career she spent in this uh, Carnegie Institution and, of course, observing uh, in, in different observatories and especially in this McDonald Observatory. Uh, her scientific achievements, the I mean, this the most important work was related to the discovery of the 
uh, rotation curves of galaxies uh, is discovered that the rotation curves of galaxies are almost flat. We know that this is a very good confirmation of the existence of dark matter. And uh, uh, she also discovered that in some galaxies, the gas and stars rotate in opposite direction. This was a hint that galaxies evolved by colliding or merging. So uh, his main, uh, her main achievements were related to galactic work. As you can see in this picture, she was uh, dedicated observers, so, so used many telescopes and also worked with the photographic plates, as you can see in, in this bottom right picture. Uh, so th this is Rubin Observatory, named after, after Vera Rubin in, in 2020. Very unusual, very unusual uh, 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 structure, I would say. The telescope itself and the, the, the whole building, which is, uh, which is connected with the telescope. You can see probably here in the summit is the CITIO, but I'm not sure. Is there are some people in the audience who know CTIO, so I guess, suppose they can, can verify if this is really a CTIO, which can be seen here. This is, it is 10 kilometers away, so probably it's, it fits. This is how the observatory looks like. There, are the other telescopes can be seen here in, in different in different summits of the observatory. Uh, and here's how the, the 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 building and the telescopes look like. So we have the telescope. I will say a few words more on the telescope, which is very heavy, of course, in this uh, located on this 60 meter telescope uh, pyre. We have windscreens, uh, which uh, for good ventilation of the telescope, the the dome itself is 30 meters high. There is, of course, because uh, the telescope consists of, uh, I will say, two mirrors. Uh, they have to be uh, coated from time to time or recoated. So there is a vertical platform lift for, for moving these, these mirrors to this uh, coating chamber, which is here because, of course, nobody moves such a big uh, such a big mirror to somewhere else. This is very difficult operation to, to move this mirror or the telescope, the whole telescope to the summit. So the coating will be made, of course, from time to time uh, at, uh, at, at the site. Uh, a few more pictures uh, showing these uh, 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 either coating uh, or uh, grinding of the mirror, just because the both the camera and the telescope are uh, are now built. So you can see, see here a, a big mirror. In fact, these are two mirrors. I will say more about that in a, in a minute. Uh, the mirror uh, the mirror was transported to the side through this tunnel. So this is probably so it. it, it it barely fitted the tunnels. So this is probably the, uh, close to the limit of the of the diameter of the uh, of the telescope that can be built on this uh, on this site. Again, we send, we can see the telescope here still in, in the in the phase of of, of uh, mounting, and from from top. So this is very complicated uh, operation, of course, to to put all these pieces together. Uh, and build the telescope. So from the from top of this building, or from a drone, or uh, a picture. This is uh, this is not uh, this is not the current picture. It was made a few months ago. I tried to get a newer picture, but unfortunately, the the web camera doesn't work now. So I, I don't know what what happens. But it is close to completion. I mean, in general, the, the observatory is, is very close to completion. And a few more words about the telescope itself. So this is very um, unusual optical uh, construction. This is three mirror telescope, not only, but it, it's, it's it, in fact, this is the catadioptric system because in, in addition to three mirrors, it, con it also consists of three lenses. So this is called Paul Baker Massen Schmidt Wide Angle Telescope with a very complicated name, but 
uh, why this construction is, uh, is is made in this way. Just the, I mean, the main idea was to make a telescope that can provide relatively wide um, field of view. We perfectly know that uh, that mirror tele telescope made of mirrors cannot provide a wide angle view uh, because of of uh, the diff different uh, different effects. Uh, if so, only a combination of mirrors and some other optical elements, like for example, in Schmidt camera, we have this special plate. Can can it can give us a large field of view? Here, we have a uh, we have three three mirrors, but two of them are are I mean made from a single single slab of of, of glass. In fact, the field of view, the diameter of the field of view is three point five. Uh, degrees, so it's quite uh, quite large for a mirror telescope for a reflector. Uh, and, and the surface is about 10 square degrees. The effective aperture, because the, the, the secondary mirror covers a large part of the primary mirror, the effective aperture is not uh, over eight meters as the diameter of the primary mirror. It's smaller, it's 6.7 meters, so it fits quite well the, the original assumption that that we that a 6.5 meter class telescope will be built of course all this is very heavy the whole telescope weights about 350 tons the primary mirror itself it's over 16 tons the camera is very important for this project because it's very very big camera 3.2 gigapixels the, the scale and the, the focal plane is open to arc seconds per pixel. And the telescope is located at the, uh, the uh, more than two and a half kilometers above the sea level. So it, it's quite high, of course. This is the optics of the telescope. As you can see on the left hand side, there the, 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 the first mirror, the M1, is the, is the largest mirror. It's 0.4 meters in diameter, but the, the secondary mirror is located here. It's 3.5 meters in diameter, which means that a large part of the primary mirror is obscured by the secondary mirror. But this is this is not important because the third mirror is made with the same with the same part, so it has different curvature curvature than the primary mirror, but it's uh, it's again five meters wide, so this obscuration doesn't count. In fact, in addition to this, uh, there is some. There are three lenses on the optical pad. The largest one is one point fifty five uh, meters uh, in diameter, so it's quite large. And there are two other lenses. Why these three lenses? Well, the the main idea is to flatten the focal plane. This is very important because it's a, such a big camera, it's good to have it flat. I mean, uh, for example, in Kepler satellite, because it's a Schmidt camera, the, the focal uh, plane is not flat. So it, uh, the, the, the detectors has to be placed in, in, a, in a very unusual way, not in a flat plane. In, here in this situation, these three mirrors and three lenses um, uh, make the uh, focal plane flat, which is very good for placing there the uh, the, the, de the detectors. Of course, there are some, I mean, the, the quality of the image is not perfect because it cannot be perfect, even with these complicated optics. So let's say, as you can see here, uh, at um, uh, well, slightly less than two degrees from the optical axis, the 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 shape of the image is uh, is distorted in this way. But still, uh, still uh, the 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 image uh, size is, uh, is uh, fits perfectly the the size of the uh, of the pixels of the detectors. So the at the uh, far from the optical axis, the quality of the image will be slightly worse but still very, very good. 
So this is the the made in fact the, the main mirror or in fact two mirrors because this is M1 mirror here and M3 mirror in in the in the central part of this of this uh, uh, glass. Uh, just for a reminder, the 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 main mirror is 8.5 meters uh, um, in diameter. The third mirror is five meters in, in diameter. Uh, both uh, this mirror is uh, is uh, is made by the Richard Carris Mirror Laboratory in, in the at the University of Arizona, and this is the uh, the the shape of the mirrors as you can see there is uh, here is the edge of the M1 mirror, so the inside part of this shape is the M3 mirror, and there is of course a hole in the middle of this tertiary surface. Uh, one of the uh, requirements for this telescope was a very fast movement. In fact, the, the requirement is that the telescope should move from uh, pointing to pointing within five seconds. Uh, this, uh, this, this, was, this is very, uh, I mean, a difficult requirement because uh, and, and a lot of power is needed to move the telescope and then to, to, to break then. So a uh, large capacitors are located in the dome just to allow for this very fast movement from pointing to pointing. Uh, as I said, the aluminization of the mirrors will be made on site. So this is the aluminization uh, chamber, uh, which is which is at the at the, at the summit in the, in the same building uh, as the as the other uh, equipment. And uh, as I said, uh, in addition to these three mirrors, there are three lenses. So the largest lens, this is this L one lens. Uh, is 1.55 meters in diameter, but there are two more. So this is this is very complicated. Uh, this is very complicated uh, optical uh, uh, equipment, and uh, and of course the camera. The camera is even more complicated. So that's why it they started to build the camera uh, already in, in eight years ago or something like this. The manufacturer of the camera is the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory in California. So this is the general view of the camera and the all the electronics and other things which will uh, work together with the camera. Uh, so the detector, as I said, the, the, the whole camera consists of 189 CCD detectors. These are deep, deep depletion back illuminated detectors, CCD detectors. They are arranged in clusters of nine detectors. Each of these detectors is 4K by a 4K cam a camera. The pixels are 10 micrometers wide and the, the scale in the focal plane is 0.2 arc seconds per pixel, as I said. Uh, so they are, these cameras are arranged into uh, the clusters of nine detectors. There are 21 in, uh, these nine detector clusters, which are uh, in fact independent of each other. And the readout speed is uh, uh, 1.6 gigapixel per second, which means that the whole image can be read out during two seconds. This is a very short time as for such a big uh, camera. So this is the whole this is the whole thing. I mean, this, is, this detector itself is inside here. We have of course cryostat to cool the to cool the detectors. We have filters. They would have to be very very large also because uh, because the detector is very large. We have these lenses at the at the beginning of this this assembly and all the electronics uh, in, in, the, in the rear side of this. Uh, this is a single tower, so-called tower consisting of nine CCD detectors. So each of these towers, 21 towers is an autonomous, fully testable, 144 megapixel camera, in fact. Mm. And uh, finally, filters. So this is uh, one of the one of the main ideas behind this project was to make uh, 
a time series photometry, but not in a single band or two, just two bands as for many other projects, but in six bands. This is very this is very unusual. So this is something which is different from other surveys. And the past bands chosen uh, chosen for these projects were, of course, uh, um, the, the, these uh, similar to SD, SDSS UGR IZY filters. So these filters combine it with the with the uh, with the atmospheric transmission look like this. So of course the as you can see the the U filter will not. Uh, I mean the the uh, the expected uh, depth of the U filter survey will be will be uh, likely smaller than in in the other pass beds. All right. So now about the science with the within this telescope, because this project is, is I mean, the main uh, part of the project is uh, is predicted for ten years, uh, and the, the this driving science can be summarized as follows. So the, the one of the most important things is the understanding the nature of dark matter and dark energy. So if uh, this will be by studying distribution of dark matter, measuring effects of, and measuring effects of dark energy through the measurements of gravitational lensing, uh, supernovae, galaxy clusters, large scale structure of the universe, satellite galaxies also will be observed in galactic flows. And uh, um, in addition to this, because we have time series photometry, uh, the study of variable stars and transient objects will be very important. So this is so-called the variable sky and the transient sky. So if, uh, transients will be also the one of the driving science subjects in this survey. Of course, exploring the structure of the galaxy, our galaxy and its neighbors is also very important in this project uh, because we have different stellar population in, in in satellite galaxies, for example, in in Magellanic clouds, which will be will be observed in in the dedicated surveys um, as well. And finally, the so-called the, the moving sky, which is an overview of solar system objects. So the, these will include near Earth asteroids, potentially hazard asteroids, main belt asteroids, and Kuiper belt. Objects so many 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 very different types of uh, solar system objects important from the point of view of course of of the evolution of our solar system but also from the point of view of our um, safety I would say a few more more words uh, a few more details on these scientific goals so the main survey is called. Uh, wide, fast, and deep survey. So this will be main survey, which will cover uh, 80,000 square degrees between declinations minus 62 and plus two. So this is this blue region in this map. This map is made in the equatorial coordinates. So, so as you can see, the almost the whole Southern sky will be covered and a small part of the Northern sky uh, within this main survey uh, the, the, there will be two visits per night for a given field every three, four nights. So on average, 811 visits over 10 years in all six filters will be made for a given a given uh, star or galaxy or in general, a given point. The exposure will be 30 seconds long. It's still discussed whether this will be two 15 seconds long exposure, then combine it or just a single 30 seconds long exposure. These green uh, areas show different uh, other surveys, but this main survey will be the southern sky uh, shown here in, in, in blue. Uh, so uh, this, 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 this plot on the left-hand side shows more or less the number of visits uh, in different places. They, there will be some uh, there will be some differences between different places in this in the sky, but on average, these eight hundred eleven visits in all six filters will be made. Of course, 
the number of visits in each filter will not be the same, exactly the same. So in general, if there will be a smaller number of visits in U and G filters and slightly larger in, in amount of, of visits in the, in, the, in the remaining four filters. So this is, a, of course, not a big number. I would say some, would, some people who are working with variable stars or variable objects can say that these are not large numbers, especially because these the observations will be distributed over 10 years. But this is, uh, I mean, this is still a number which is larger than, for example, Gaia will provide or Hipparchus in the past provided. So a lot of uh, interesting work, especially because this is a very deep survey, will be uh, can be made with these observations. Of course, we would like would prefer to have more uh, observations for this variable uh, for variability study, but this is what we can what we can get what we get in fact. The other the next uh, survey. Uh, so uh, in addition to this main survey. Uh, wide fast deep survey. There are uh, four other surveys. One of them is so-called deep drilling fields (DDF). So we'll co which will cover a very small parts. There are the large, dark blue dots somewhere here in the sky. So these are the the pointings where the, these deep drilling field uh, fields will be are located. So this uh, survey will cover approximately 50 square degrees. It will be observed at the higher cadence and with longer exposure times. So fields will be observed every three, four days. The, with the five filter sequence in gray and light to, to in bright time, I would say, and the U observation, U filter observations will be made in, in dark time. Uh, this uh, um, well was the was the purpose of observing these deep drilling fields. And in general, there are several uh, uh, several scientific reasons for that. Usually related to the to the galactic work, especially testing and refining photometric redshifts, which are critical to the to the main survey. Uh, determination of the distribution of populations of galaxies fainter than the depth of the main survey. Uh, that contributed the signals induced by lensing enhancement in the main survey. So the micro, uh, micro uh, gravitational lensing is important in this work, but also the, some work related to AGNs uh, in this survey will be is, is important for this server. So several uh, the pointings were is, uh, were selected, just because uh, usually because in this place is, there are some other observations. Uh, for example, in one of these uh, fields, uh, ECDFS field, there is a lot of other observations in different uh, wavelength passbands in X rays and ultraviolet, and near infrared, radio, and so on. And that's why these fields were selected, just because that there are many more other observations of objects in these fields. So a lot, I mean, uh, this will be, if, I mean, complementary observations to other work to be able to characterize mainly extragalactic sources that are located in this in these locations. One of the most important things is the photometric redshifts. Red shifts, um, well, multiband photometry can be regarded as a very, very low resolution spectroscopy, in fact, and especially for the determination of photometric redshifts. Red shifts, uh, uh, this is very important just to, just to explain what is this photometric redshifts. If we have a galaxy of uh, the, late uh, morphological time, which means this, it contains a lot of interstellar interstellar matter. Uh, these galaxies are usually called Lyman break galaxies because uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, neutral hydrogen around these galaxies, which means that the, all the radiation with the wavelengths shortened than, than, than Lyman uh, um, jump uh, are absorbed by this matter. 
which means that the observed spectrum of the galaxy look like this. So there is practically no radiation below, uh, below the Lyman, Lyman jump. Uh, if such a galaxy is observed photometrically at several bands, so this means that at these bands, when there is some, uh, there is some radiation, uh, this galaxy can be seen like in these four images. But in the pass band, which is located left of this Lyman break, there is there is nothing. So that nothing can be seen just because the radiation, uh, all radiation from this range is absorbed. And this uh, uh, the, this at the beginning, uh, three pass bands were used to detect such uh, these Lyman break galaxies. For example, here you can see it's uh, quite. Uh, quite a large field of view with many, many objects. And it's uh, the question is how to select uh, uh, distant galaxies in this in this image. So the, the, the idea after this method is that in the UV band, there is nothing seen, seen but in the green and red band, we can easily see a galaxy here. So in this way, it's 150 galaxies in this image were selected using this Lyman break. Of course, this method with this set of filters works for a given range of uh, red shifts. Uh, originally, this method was used to detect galaxies with the red shift three, four, maybe five, just because in this two color diagram, uh, as you, you can see here, different types of galaxies of different morphological type uh, with the uh, red shifts between three, let's say, and four, are located practically at the same along the same line shown here. Uh, so uh, th this is very very useful. So the, regardless of the morphological type, the the, say, the galaxies at the same or the red shifts are located so have the same uh, I mean colors in this three color pass band in this three color system. Of course, later on, uh, these uh, because we can use different uh, pass bands. Later on, this uh, the, this method was used also to uh, to detect the galaxies at at smaller and uh, higher redshifts than this three, four, five. Let's say, uh, and for example, here you can uh, you you see the 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 the, the theoretical spectrum of the varial distant galaxy at the redshift 9.5. And of course, to detect in this way, this galaxy, we have to use pass bands which are located in the infrared. So many, for example, JWST pass bands uh, on observations are used to detect very distant galaxies with redshifts red higher than 10. Another example of this kind of fitting when we have uh, the uh, theoretical spectrum in blue of a of a galaxy of a red shifted galaxy, and uh, some multiband observations uh, with uh, shown with red points, and some fits that show the the, the red shift about eight here, in, in practically all these cases. Of course, the the precision of the determination of Redshift in this way is not very high, but this can be done uh, because the, these galaxies are so faint that no spectrum can be made to derive uh, uh, redshift uh, by the uh, calculating the, the shift of the spectral lines. The next uh, uh, the next mini survey, uh, the third mini survey, is in the galactic plane. So this is this this part of the of the sky. This will cover the central part of the galactic plane omitted in the WFD survey. Uh, uh, during this survey, several times fewer visits will be made and it will cover uh, 1,860 square, uh, square degrees, mainly for astrometry and averaged photometry. This, this survey will be used in the galactic plane. Next one, is uh, in turn the um, focus it on solar system objects. This is called North Ecliptic Spur Mini Server. So this is this part of the of the sky. So this is northern sky. This part of the northern sky, which is close to the ecliptic. So this is mainly for the detection of the of the asteroids and other objects which are 
uh, which are close, which uh, have orbits which are close to the ecliptic. Uh, the, in this survey, only these four filters, G, R, I, Z, will be used just because this will be at the, the well, because this is Southern Observatory, so this this these pointings will be quite low above the horizon. So this this U filter uh, will not be used in this survey. And finally, the fifth uh, survey, which is South Celestial Pole uh, Mini Survey. So this is this part of the sky. The rest, I would say, the rest of the southern sky. This is the vicinity of the South Pole, more than two thousand square degrees. Uh, what is important, this part will include Magellanic clouds because Magellanic clouds are very important for different studies. So they will be uh, covered in this uh, in this mini survey. So these are the five surveys which will be made with the LSST during these 10 years. And the depth of observation, which is, uh, which is just, this is, these numbers are very, important because they show that the depth is really, the, the survey will be really very, very deep, much deeper than many other survey, ground-based surveys. So depending on the passband, the, the depth is different, but as you can see, for, for the combined images from 10 years, uh, the depth will reach 26th magnitude, sometimes almost 27th magnitude in some, in, in some passband. So this will be really very, very deep. Okay, and uh, some numbers to impress the audience. Uh, so there will be about 2,000 images per night, so about 20 terabytes of data per night. Uh, during the whole 10-year survey, there will be 60 petabytes of data or 5.5 millions of, of images. Six bands, bands, well length range quite uh, large because, of course, this will cover near and ultraviolet visual range and, of course, near uh, infrared. The our, our analysis will be automatic, so the survey will generate alerts. This is especially important for transients. So the alerts will be uh, issued after 60 seconds. So it's predicted that about 10 to 7 hours per night will be will be generated. The number of data points, as I said, about 80 data points per year, about 800 data points during the whole 10 year survey. There will be 11 data releases uh, and the predicted number of detected objects. It's about 38 billions of objects, including 20 billions of galaxies, 17 billions of stars, 10 millions of supernovae, and 6 millions of solar system objects that will have determinate orbits. So this is really impressive. And there is no other uh, survey like that, uh, provided that this number will be, uh, will be confirmed by real observations. So finishing my talk, this is the, the, the timeline of the analysis uh, of, uh, and observations. So the first observations will start at the end of this year. Uh, the first uh, data release is predicted for in more or less two years from now in 2026. So it is very soon. I mean, very soon this, this observatory will start working and will provide data for the analysis. Uh, and of course, uh, I have to mention about the conferences which are related to this project. So there's already five conferences in Europe, uh, the LSST at Europe, the last one in, in the Croatia in 2023, this year in September at La Palma in Spain, the sixth conference LSST at Europe is, will be held. But the next one, the seventh European LSST conference will be held in, in Poland, in Poznan, in fact, in 2025. The exact dates are not yet known, I guess. So the Polish consortium already co includes the, the, the several institutions, six at the beginning, the lead, Polish leader is Agnieszka Polo, uh, there are two new institutions of my home in the uh, university and Adam Mickiewicz University. So there, at least now, there are 
uh, eight different institutions are people from eight different institutions interested in working with LSST data and uh, given the the science which uh, which uh, will probably the data they will provide i'm pretty sure there will be more people interested in doing science with, with this data thank you very much okay thank you very much andre are there questions I will, I will just comment here. Sorry for the wind outside. I, I will just comment uh, about the, the, the galactic plane survey is that um, there, is, there is still time to change this and there is a lobby of people interested in the galactic science the, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm part of them. So we're trying to push to have slightly an increased uh, number of epochs uh, covering the galactic plane something something similar to this wide uh, wide area uh, of coverage so instead of you know hundreds of images to have thousands of images in the galactic plane and that will be a, a very significant for all the variable time variable studies microlensing and so on so this is we still hope this is this is gonna change it doesn't cost that much time of lsst overall because it's a very wide uh, field uh, telescope so this is still not set in stone but um, uh, i hope it will improve Okay, any other comments and questions? It's okay. time for landing here. <laughs> it's time for landing, okay. So I don't see any more questions. So thank you, Andre, very much. That was very uh, enlightening and very uh, interesting. So uh, thank you all for joining and 